Killers in Your States, Part 1. Welcome to Alabama. This guy is Jack Harrison Trawick, and he was born in 1947, and he would die in the Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore on June 11, 2009. He was given a life sentence for killing Eileen Pruitt and then given the death penalty for killing Stephanie Gatch in 1992. He was a career criminal uh, charged with burglary, impersonating a police officer, kidnapping, making threatening phone calls, breaking and entering, property destruction. In fact, he was diagnosed in 1970 as being a paranoid schizophrenic with homicidal impulses. He would be in jail from 1983 to 1990 for previous charges. Then in 1994, they brought him in just for questioning for attempted abductions, and he actually would admit to killing Stephanie Gatch in 1992. In 2001, a woman would write to him asking for information about his crimes, and he would go in depth on his philosophy about murdering women. He claimed he killed 11 other women, and they were able to corroborate one, a woman by the name of Betty Jo Richards from Walker County in 1972. Killers in Your State, Part 2. Welcome to Alaska. So see, when I think about Alaska, I think about the northern lights and the beautiful snow, and I think about Robert Hansen. See, Alaska happens to have the most killers per population of any other state. And while there are a lot of people to choose from, Robert Hansen is the one that I find to be the most awful. In 1971, he started abducting sex workers and he would take them back to a cabin that he had in the woods where he would assault them, but then he would release them. And ultimately his intention was to chase them down and hunt them through the wilderness in Anchorage. Yes, he turned the short story, The Most Dangerous Game, into his real life. When he was caught in 1983, he actually confessed to 17 different murders, but they only had enough evidence to convict him for four, which makes you wonder, where are the other bodies? He was sentenced to 461 years in prison, pretty much life, without the possibility of parole, and he would die at 75 years old, August 21st in 2014. Killers in Your State, Part 3. Welcome to Arizona. And just like this picture says, when I think of Arizona, I think of the Grand Canyon. But apparently in 2005 and 2006, Arizona was dealing with a real problem. There were actually two killers simultaneously in Phoenix. But today we're going to talk about Mark Adot, who's also known as the Baseline Killer. And before I get into this, some of his victims were as young as 12 years old, so please don't lust after him. When he was ultimately arrested, he killed nine people, sexually assaulted 15, and kidnapped 11. The murders were always particularly brutal and the women were always doing something particularly normal, like vacuuming their car or walking to the bus stop, things of that nature. Essentially making it so women felt like they couldn't do anything while he was active. He would be arrested after being linked to an assault on two sisters. There was big controversy around this case because they actually had Marcado's DNA on file nine months before he was caught, but they didn't test it in a timely manner. Phoenix PD would release 20,000 pages of documents to try and explain themselves. Killers in your state, part four. It's Arkansas. There isn't really a more prolific serial killer in Arkansas outside of Ronald Gene Simmons. He was a sexual offender as well as being a spree killer, and he killed 16 people over a week-long period in 1987. The retired military man uh, murdered 14 members of his own family, including a daughter he had previously sexually assaulted and the child that resulted from that assault, as well as a former co-worker, a stranger, and he wounded four other people. These crimes happened in the cities of Russellville and Dover, Arkansas. He was actually given 16 death sentences, and unlike most people on death row, he refused to appeal them, and he would be executed on June 25th, 1990. Kind of understandably so, no one else in his family wanted anything to do with him, and they actually refused to claim his body, and he was buried in a potter's field anonymously. Killers in your state, part five. It's California. Sunny California, known for its wonderful beaches and beautiful landscapes, and also having the highest number of serial killers of any other state, totaling 1,628. You know so many of them, like Ed Kemper, Rodney Alcala, the Golden State Killer, the Hillside Strangler, but we're not going to talk about them today. Instead, I introduce you to Lonnie Franklin Jr., also known as the Grim Sleeper, who began a series of killings in South Los Angeles in the summer of 1985 and would continue until 1988. It's believed he only stopped because the victim survived, and she was able to give the police a very good description of who he was and how he behaved. For 13 years, there would be no slayings by him until March of 2002, where they found the body of a teenage girl. Because of the lull in attacks between attacks, they called him the Grim Sleeper. He was sentenced to death 10 times, once for each of his victims. But he was found unresponsive in his cell, March 2020. Killers in your estates, part six, it's Colorado. Welcome to colorful Colorado, home of... 
Scott Lee Kimball, an FBI informant turned serial killer. In 2002, Scott was in prison for fraud and he convinced the FBI to release him so that he could be an informant. All four of his victims died between January 2003 and August of 2004 while he was on supervised release. He killed his uncle, his ex-cellmate's girlfriend, and he killed a 19-year-old girl. Those three were all recovered in Colorado and also in Utah. A fourth body has never been recovered, and that is assumed to be the young woman, Jennifer Markham. Like many other serial killers, he has bragged and boasted about killing other people, but they have not been able to corroborate any of his stories. He is currently serving 70 years for these three murders. Killers in Your State, Part 7. Welcome to Connecticut. Connecticut doesn't really have a huge history of serial killers or a whole lot of murder to begin with, but in 2003, things got a little weird. This is William Devin Howell, and in 2003, he roamed the streets of Connecticut in a van that he called his murder mobile. It was well named because it's where he abducted, assaulted, and murdered seven different people. While he abducted people all over the state, he apparently had a particular place he liked to bury them in East Hartford behind a shopping mall, and he called that place his garden, and he would visit as sort of a memorial to the bodies. He'd get caught about a year later in 2004 when his car was seized, and they found a lot of blood, and they also found six videotapes of him having bizarre intercourse with people who were missing. On trial, he said, I know everyone wants to know why I committed these crimes. I don't have an answer. I don't know myself. And then he got 360 years. Killers in your state, part eight. This is Delaware. And as the sign says, Delaware is a small wonder. So small, in fact, they only have one serial killer in the history of the state. His name is Stephen Brian Pennell, and he is most well known as the Route 40 killer. Between 1987 and 1988, he would prey on sex workers, specifically picking them up near Bear, Delaware on Route 40. As the death toll continued to rise, they had only one clue, which was that every body that they found had blue carpet fibers on them. On September 14, 1988, Renee Toshner, an undercover police officer, would pose as a prostitute and wait on Route 40 looking for cars. Pennell would pull up to her. He was nervous. He wouldn't look her in the eye, but she noticed the blue carpet and she was like, that's it. So she managed to grab a piece of the carpet and write down his license plate. That was all they needed before they got him. He was found guilty of murdering two of his victims, though the total number is potentially five. Bizarrely, during his trial, he asked to be put to death, but he never admitted to doing anything wrong. Killers in your state, part nine. Welcome to Florida. I think everyone knows the jokes about Florida men and how crazy the state can be, but Florida happens to have one of the youngest serial killers in America. She was 19 years old when she choked five infants between 1980 and 1982. One of the shocking things about this case is how much of these murders were actually written off by doctors as a heart disease, a traumatic brain injury from falling out of a crib, sudden infant death syndrome. It would take until 1982 when she killed a 10 week old baby for a doctor to go, maybe we should do an autopsy. The autopsy confirmed that the child had been smothered and when the police contacted Christine, she immediately admitted and said that she had killed three children. She also said that whenever she was around a child, she just had a very strong urge. Someone inside her said, kill the baby. Direct quote. She was sentenced to life in prison in 1982, and in 2017, she attempted to go for parole and was promptly denied. Killers in your state, part 10. This is Georgia. Between the year 1979 and 1981, Atlanta was in a state of panic because 28 different black children were killed, and they had no idea who was doing it. A lot of people settled on this man, Wayne Williams, a freelance photographer currently in prison for two murders that have nothing to do with the Atlanta child murders. The reason why they think it's him? Well, he failed three different polygraph tests and they found evidence of the fibers from his house on some of the victims, as well as pet hair from his dog on the victims. Williams has maintained his innocence and he says that the police just pinned it on him because they needed somebody to go down for it because they weren't doing their job. There's even been discussion that the KKK might have been involved because one of the early suspects was a white supremacist by the name of Charles T. Sanders. Former FBI profiler John Douglas wrote in his book Mindhunter that forensic and behavioral evidence points conclusively to Wayne Williams. Murdering Your State, Part 11. This is Hawaii. On November 2nd, 1999, at 8 a.m., Byron Uyasugi walked into work and opened fire on his co-workers. Oyasugi had been working at Xerox since 1984, and 
he didn't really like his job. In fact, when interviewed, some of his other coworkers said that he had discussed openly committing a mass shooting since 1995. He pled guilty by reason of insanity and claimed that he felt like an outcast at his job and he feared that his colleagues were trying to conspire to get him fired. Some doctors did testify saying that he was slightly delusional and did think that people were out to get him, but they said that he did not meet the criteria for insanity or extreme emotional disturbance. He was charged with one murder in the first degree and seven counts in second degree. As Hawaii does not have the death penalty, he was given 235 years in prison. Killers in Your State, Part 12. This is Idaho. And if you don't know, this is Lydia Southard, and she makes a list because she is credited with being Idaho's first serial killer, as well as potentially America's first female serial killer. In the early 1900s, she murdered her four former husbands, her brother-in-law, and even her own daughter. And also, all of her husbands, after she got out of prison, also disappeared. It's believed she killed them for insurance purposes, and they gave her 10 years to life. But that just was 10 years too much because Lydia needed to get out, and she sweet-talked another prisoner who was getting released, who went and got a car and waited for her on the side of the road. She managed to evade capture for about a year until they got her in 1932. She'd remain there until 1941 when she was paroled. Lydia died of a heart attack in 1958 in Salt Lake City. She defended her innocence until the day she died. Unfortunately, her hairless body would portray her because hair loss is a side effect of prolonged arsenic exposure. Serial Killers in Your State, Part 13, it's Illinois, and we can't talk about Illinois without talking about John Wayne Gacy, can we? Gacy is referred to as the Killer Clown, and that was because of his persona as Pogo the Clown. Can we just have a discussion about how this is just terrifying and no child would find this enjoyable? And also, apparently he wore it while he was murdering people. So this was the last thing people saw before they died, and that's just really sad. He assaulted young boys and men in the 1970s, and he was found guilty on 33 counts of murder and put to death in 1994. 26 bodies were found in the crawl space under his house, and he had to draw a diagram for the police as they were ripping apart his house to try and find the bodies. While he was under arrest in 1978, I mean, they completely dismantled the house, ripped it limb from limb, and then finally just demolished the entire property. According to one of the workers involved in the demolition of Gacy's house, the guy said if the devil's alive, he lived here. Killers in your state, part 14. This is Indiana. Herbert Baumeister was a normal dude. He had a really successful thrift shop. He had a wife of 25 years and three kids. And what his wife didn't know was that he liked to cruise gay bars at night, picking up young men and murdering them. Eventually, the police started showing up at his home and asking questions. And then one time, while his wife was outside with the children, one of the kids brought her a human skull. In 1996, after his wife was sufficiently frightened of him and Herb was on vacation, she would let the police search the property. A search of the 18-acre estate would turn up the remains of 11 bodies, but only eight would be identified because they had been burned and pulverized. And bonus, they were actually only 50 feet away from the house where the children played. Baumeister fled to Ontario, Canada, where he took his own life. Post-death, he'd be linked to the I-70 murders, which were nine other men who were killed in the late 80s. Killers in your state, part 15. It's Iowa. This man is Carol Edward Cole, and while he didn't do the majority of his crimes in Iowa, he was born here, and it shaped him. While in Iowa, he lived with his mother, who often beat him, and there he grew to hate her, as well as all women, apparently. Between 1948 and 1980, Cole strangled and killed 13 women across multiple states because, as he said, it made him feel like he was killing his mother. He was found guilty and sentenced to death, and he actually refused to appeal this sentence because, quote, it would be unbearable to stay here any longer. Well, Iowa helped him out, and he was executed in 1985. Killers in your state, part 16. It's Kansas, and we're going to talk about the Bloody Benders. The Bloody Benders were this German family who settled in southeastern Kansas in Labette County in 1871. On the surface, it seemed as if they operated an inn and they sold supplies to travelers. It was along with poor people noticed that folks were going missing and they actually saw that the Bender estate was empty. So they assumed that the family had been victims too. But oh no, when they searched the property, they found 11 people who were buried across the property. 
there was one log cabin on the property and right in the middle there was a curtain. It's believed that they would hit the person with a hammer and then drop them into the cellar, which when the local search was covered in pools of blood. They found the majority of the bodies in the local orchard. And here's the best part. You can actually own this property because right now, February of 2021, it's for sale. And the current owner says they have never excavated the property, so who knows what you'll find. Killers in your state, part 17, it's Kentucky. This is Edward Edwards, and outside of having a rather unfortunate name, he had a really crazy life. Most recently, he admitted to killing his 25-year-old foster son in 1996 for a $250,000 life insurance policy. He got the death penalty for that. He was already in jail for killing a 21-year-old in Doylestown and an 18-year-old in Sterling in 1977. He also admitted to killing two 19-year-olds who were leaving Jefferson County, Wisconsin in August of 1980. He actually got caught because in 2009, one of his children saw a news article and realized that they had started school in Watertown in 1980, but then abruptly had to leave Wisconsin. In his autobiography, Metamorphosis of a Criminal, he said when he was asked what he wanted to be when he grew up, he told one of the nuns at the orphanage, Sister, I'm going to be a crook and I'm going to be a good one. Killers in Your State, Part 18. This is Louisiana. I'm not going to just talk about one serial killer because since 1997, Baton Rouge and the area around it has had no less than five serial killers. The crime writer Susan Mustafa actually puts the tally of serial killer deaths at roughly 67. There is Derek Lee Todd right here, then Sean Gillis, then Jeffrey Guillory, and also Ronald Dominique. And we can't forget the Jeff Davis Eight, which are eight women who were found in swamps around Jefferson Davis Parish in Louisiana, and they were all killed between 2005 and 2009. This is actually the flyer from the FBI requesting information on any of these young women because they have no idea who did this. I would like to take this moment and ask, Louisiana, is everything okay down there? Killers in your state, part 19. It's time to talk about Maine. Like most of the smaller states, there's not that many serial killers, but this man is John Joubert, and he ended his serial killer tenure in Maine. When John was just a young boy, he apparently had a fantasy, a fantasy of killing his babysitter and eating her. And in the 1970s, he would make his fantasy a reality. He killed two different boys in Nebraska when he worked at the Air Force by strangling them and then taking bites out of them. And then he went to Maine, where he abducted an 11-year-old boy and did the same thing. Further investigation in Maine found that he stabbed a nine-year-old girl in 1979, along with a nine-year-old boy and a teacher, and all were considered to be badly cut and lucky to be alive. When John was caught, he said he was happy because he knew he would kill again if he wasn't stopped. And Maine didn't have the death penalty, but Nebraska sure did, and he met his fate in the electric chair in 1996. Serial Killers in Your State, Part 20. We're on Maryland. This is Joseph Metheny, and overall, he just had a life of crime. It started in the 90s in Baltimore, where he spent all of his money on crack cocaine, heroin, and liquor, and he got into a lot of trouble. He began trying to lure sex workers to his trailer that he was living in, and he would stab, strangle them, and brutally assault them. In the midst of him killing sex workers, he also got investigated for killing homeless people in 1995. In 1996, he met a woman named Rita Kemper, and he attempted to assault her after they did drugs together. She escaped through a window, and he did get charged with three different murders and was facing the death penalty. What catapulted him to national news, however, was that he told the Baltimore Sun newspaper that he was grinding up the bodies of the people who he killed, 13, he said, and mixing them with food and selling them out of a food truck. Killers in Your State, Part 21, Massachusetts. Massachusetts is home to the Boston Strangler and the New Bedford Highway Killer, but we're going to talk about one of America's youngest serial killers, Jesse Pomeroy. Born in 1860, little is known about his early life until he was 11 years old and he started attacking other children. Between the fall and winter of 1871, he attacked seven other boys in Boston. He'd take them to a secret spot where he'd strip them and beat them. After he was caught, he went to a reform school and they let him out within a year for good behavior. 
Of course, once he got out, he was no longer just violent. He was homicidal and he kidnapped and killed a little girl in March of 1874. And then a month later did it to a little boy who was so badly hurt that he was almost decapitated. When the police interviewed him about the little boy, he said, I suppose I did it. The citizens wanted an execution, but the governor just couldn't sign the death warrant. He died in 1932 at the Bridgewater Hospital for the Criminally Insane. Killers in Your State, Part 22. Welcome to Michigan. This man committed the Michigan murders, which were a series of highly publicized killings of young women between 1967 and 1969 in the Ann Arbor area of southeastern Michigan. All of the victims were between the ages of 13 and 21, and they were abducted, sexually assaulted, and murdered, typically through stabbing or strangulation. The audacious uh, John Norman Collins was found guilty of the last murder, which was the only one they were able to convict him for and given life in prison, which he has appealed consistently ever since. Although he was never tried for the other murders attributed to the Michigan murderer and a six girl who was killed in California, investigators believe he's responsible for it. And that's another reason why his appeals keep getting overturned. He is currently incarcerated at the Marquette Branch Prison where hopefully he'll stay for the rest of his life. Killers in Your State, Part 23. It's Minnesota. And from 1980 to 1982, in the St. Paul, Minneapolis area, police had to deal with a guy who kept calling them and hysterically crying and admitting to murdering people. The voice on those recordings is Paul Michael Stephanie, and it earned him the nickname the Weepy Voiced Killer in the local newspapers. You can actually find the recordings online and they're just kind of unsettling as he is hysterically crying and giving details to what he did. This mugshot, however, came from his last victim, who he stabbed 15 times. Her name was Denise Williams and she hit him with a beer bottle before she was able to escape. When he sought medical care, he was linked to being Denise's attacker. Taking him to trial was rather difficult because even though they had his confessions in the audio tape sent to police, they couldn't really link it to him because he was sobbing hysterically on the audio. Just before dying of cancer in 1998, he'd admit to all of his crimes, including four more. Killers in Your State, Part 24. It's Mississippi. In 1995, Glenn Rogers met Linda Price at the Mississippi State Fair and they shared a drink and they became a couple and eventually they moved in together. And then the day before Halloween in 1995, Price was found dead in the bathtub and Rogers fled. And this became a pattern for him. In fact, they began calling him the cross-country killer as several other women were found slain in their bathtubs who were also redheads in different states. He was sentenced to death in both Florida and California and five deaths have been linked to him since he was uh, convicted. A 2012 documentary claims that he is the actual killer of Nicole Brown Simpson instead of O.J. Simpson, but it's never been substantiated. And in fact, Nicole Brown Simpson's family is pretty mad about it. People also mad are the families of all of his victims because he's been on death row now for over 20 years. Killers in your state, part 25. We've made it halfway and it's Missouri. This is Robert Andrew Bardella Jr. and he is known as the Kansas City Butcher and also the Collector. He was called the butcher because of the extensive dissection that he did on his victims after they were deceased. That was after he kidnapped them for six weeks and during that time period he would rape them and torture them. Finally after murdering them he would put them in little pieces and put them in trash bags and leave them all over the city. He did this to six different men between 1984 and 1987. He described his murders as his darkest fantasies becoming a reality. Between August of 1988 and December of 1988, he would admit to two first-degree murder charges and four second-degree murder charges, giving him life in prison without parole. He was only in prison for four years before he died of a heart attack at the Missouri State Penitentiary. Killers in Your State, Part 26. It's Montana. In 1973, a seven-year-old girl was kidnapped from her tent while her family was on vacation. There was no ransom note, no physical evidence. The girl was later found strangled and cut up into pieces. Her killer was David Merhofer, this man, and after getting caught, he would admit to killing two more children and two more women. While his murders are particularly heinous, he goes down in the Serial Killer Hall of Fame as being the first person that the FBI used their newest profiling technique to find. The FBI profiled that he was definitely young, 23 at the time, and that he was a white male killing for sexual satisfaction and kept parts of victims as souvenirs. All things that were true when they finally got him into an interrogation room. 
He was found one year after the seven-year-old girl, Susan Yeager, went missing, and they were able to quickly find him because of the FBI profilers. He took his own life just four hours after the interrogation. Killers in your state, part 27. It's Nebraska. This is Charles Starkweather on the day that he got arrested after murdering 11 people. His first murder happened December 1st, 1957, and then the 10 other ones happened between January 21st and January 29th in 1958. The reason why he killed 11 people over the course of two months? Because his family was upset with the fact that he was dating a 14-year-old girl. The 14-year-old girl is Carol Ann Fagott, and she uh, was his accomplice, and she was with him the entire time he was murdering people. And here she is, looking less than excited to be the youngest woman to ever be convicted of first-degree murder in the United States. For his part, uh, he was sentenced to death and killed 17 months after the day of his last crime. The courts believe that she convinced Darkweather to kill her stepfather, and she was given life in prison and paroled in 1976. Killers in your state, part 28, it's Nevada. This twisted couple are Gerald and Charlene Gallego. And the two of them together hunted sex slaves for Gerald. The con was simple. Charlene would kidnap the girls and lure them in with a false sense of safety. She would find teenagers in malls and other things, runaways, things of that nature. Then she gave them to Gerald and he used these young girls as sex slaves and ultimately killing them when he was finished. By 1980, they had killed 10 teenagers in both Nevada and California. A friend of one of the last victims witnessed the abduction and wrote down their license plate and turned it into the police. Once caught, Charlene immediately turned on her husband for a shorter sentence. Gerald was actually found guilty and sentenced to death in both California and Nevada, but he died of cancer before he was executed. Charlene got out of jail in 2013 after serving a 16-year sentence and says she was one of his victims too. Killers in your state, part 29. This is New Hampshire. This is Terry Rasmussen, and if you knew him in New Hampshire, you knew him as Bob Evans, the man who killed a woman and her three small children and stuffed their bodies in barrels in the woods. And if you knew him in California, he was Gordon Jensen, where he killed two other women who were the mothers of his children and the children. After he was released from prison for abandoning one of his other children, he went by the name Larry Vanner and married chemist on Soon Jun in 2001. And then uh, he died in prison in 2010 after being convicted of her murder in 2002. We didn't even learn that he was the uh, barrels killer from New Hampshire until 2017 when a DNA profile connected him to the other crimes. Because of all of his aliases, the newspapers refer to him as the chameleon. Killers in your state, part 30, it's New Jersey. This is Richard Beigenwald, and he was known as the thrill killer because in his words, he killed people for the hell of it. I think everybody knew the path he was heading down when at five years old, he tried to burn down his family's home with his family inside of it. That earned him a stay at the Rockland County Psychiatric Center, but it didn't do much. Because he'd commit his first murder in 1958 at the tender age of 18 during a robbery in Bayonne. He gets sentenced to life in prison, but they parole him in 1974. He keeps a low profile for three years until he starts getting arrested for attempted rape and actually raping people. He gets married and he and his wife move to Asbury Park, New Jersey, where he kills an 18-year-old girl. A friend of his wife went to police after he showed her another young woman's body that he'd hidden inside of his garage. It's believed he killed eight people and he died in 2008 of natural causes. Killers in your state, part 31, it's New Mexico. This is David Parker Ray and David Parker Ray bought a $100,000 trailer and then inside of that trailer he made it soundproof and then he also added every item that you think people could use for relations only for him it wasn't consensual. Then he would bring women there to the tune of roughly about 50 of them and he would torture them and sometimes murder them but occasionally he let them go. He also recorded it because why not be a monster? Oh, and this is his girlfriend, Cindy Hendy, who also helped him and was in some of those videos too, aiding him in abusing women. For her crimes, Cindy was uh, released after 20 years in prison without parole in 2019. 
They were actually only able to convict him for the kidnapping and assault on his three living victims. And he got 224 years and he died of a heart attack in 2002. Killers in your state, part 32. It's New York. And in 1993, the NYPD pulled over Joel Rifkin because he didn't have a license plate. During this routine traffic stop, they were suddenly overwhelmed with the smell of decomposition. And when they checked his trunk, there was the body of Tiffany Bresciani. It didn't take long for them to discover that the Long Island resident had killed 17 women over the course of four years. He dismembered the bodies and disposed of the remains hundreds of miles apart all over the state of New York. He was found guilty of killing all 17 women and was sentenced to 203 years in prison, where he still is today. In an interview he did with Daily News in 2010, he boasted about his superior body disposal method, called out the current unsolved Long Island serial killer, and then told the reporter, I was surprised I didn't get caught sooner. Killers in your state, part 33, North Carolina. The media referred to this man, Henry Lewis Wallace, as the Taco Bell Strangler. It started in 1990 in Charlotte, North Carolina, and his victims all had one thing in common, him. Each of the women was either friends with his girlfriend or worked with him at various fast food restaurants. And each of the victims had his name in their phone books. In fact, he even went to some of their funerals. He didn't really have a signature. His crimes were all over the place. Sometimes he just sexually assaulted and strangled some people. Sometimes he robbed them and assaulted them. Sometimes he just killed them because he didn't want to pay sex workers for their job. He was arrested March 13th, 1994, and for 12 hours, he confessed to killing 10 women in Charlotte and one woman on the way to Charlotte in graphic detail. The community of Charlotte was very critical of the police for feeling like they didn't do enough to find these women because they were deemed fast. He's currently on death row. Killers in your state, part 34, North Dakota. Niagara, North Dakota is a very small town just off of U.S. Highway 2, and it only has a population of roughly 53 people as of the 2010 census. It is also the home to a serial killer, a man named Eugene Butler, who was a bit of a recluse who lived on the edge of town. He was committed to the state asylum in Jamestown in 1904, and there he died in 1911. And then, four years later, when no one claimed his property, the town excavated it. There they found a hidden trap door leading to a crawl space, and inside, authorities found the remains of six young boys between the age of 15 and 18. All had been bludgeoned, and there was no motive or evidence within the home to determine why these crimes happened. No locos were missing, so they didn't know who the bodies were, and it's been hard to DNA test them because a lot of the bones were stolen. Killers in your state, part 35, it's Ohio. In 2016, police received a call in the middle of the night just outside of Columbus, Ohio, from a woman saying that she'd been kidnapped. And when the police arrived at that home, the place was filled with garbage up to the ceiling, hoarder style. When first responders arrived, the smell of decay was overwhelming, they said. And they found a body strangled under a pile of clothes. A second victim was decomposing in the basement. The man responsible is Sean Great, and that night he was removed from his home in handcuffs. He confessed to killing five women in that home, and he was found guilty and sentenced to death in 2018. The house he was living in was condemned in 2017, I'm guessing because they couldn't really get anyone to live there anymore, and it was torn down in 2020. And as for the woman who called 911, she's only listed as Jane Doe in court documents, but she saved countless women, and I hope she's living well. Killers in your state, part 36. It's Oklahoma. This is Nanny Doss, and she is known as the Giggling Granny. And she giggled during her interrogation, and this is a picture of her at her trial for murder. Who did she kill, you must say? Four of her husbands, and two of her sisters, and one of her mothers-in-law, and her grandson, and her nephew, and two of her own children, and even her own mother. While two of her husbands were indeed abusive, and so I guess I kind of understand murdering the two of them, the other people she killed purely because they annoyed her. In fact, one of her husbands told her that she should watch less TV and read the newspaper more, and she poisoned him. Uh, local newspapers reported that her personality on trial was more like a cartoon character than a real person. She was sentenced to life in prison and died in 1965.
Killers in Your State, Part 37. It's Oregon. In 1974, Randall Woodfield was drafted by the NFL to join the Green Bay Packers. Of course, the NFL didn't know that they had hired someone who was going to become one of the most prolific serial killers in America. After being cut from the team in 1974, he returned to Portland, Oregon, where he began a bizarre crime spree where he would hold women at knife point and force them to perform oral sex on him and then steal their purses. He claimed his steroid use gave him poor impulse control and he ended up out of jail by 1979. Then between 1980 and 1981, he killed potentially up to 40 people on the I-5 highway. These people he robbed, sexually assaulted, and then killed by having them lie on the ground and he would shoot them in the back of the head. He's currently 70 years old and still in jail at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Killers in your state, part 38. It's my state, Pennsylvania. This creepy fella is Gary Heidnick, and if you're a fan of Silence of the Lambs, then some of what Gary Heidnick did is part of the influence for the character Buffalo Bill. Now, Gary Heidnick was only successful in actually killing two women in his North Philadelphia home, but when one of the women who he had kidnapped escaped, they found a complete house of horrors in his basement. He kept his victims chained up and fed them a mixture of human remains and dog food. He also sexually assaulted all of them and used electric shock on them between 1986 and 1987. Those who survived said that he kept them naked and tortured them repeatedly in his basement. During his trial, he tried to claim that the women were already there in his basement when he moved in. His defense attorney tried to say that he was clearly insane. Well, Pennsylvania wasn't having it and he was given the death penalty. He was executed in 1999 and he's the last person in Pennsylvania to be executed. Serial killers in your state, part 39, it's Rhode Island. Besides being known one of the smaller states, they have Craig Price, who is one of the youngest serial killers in American history. An article in the Boston Globe said it best. He stabbed four of his neighbors to death in their own homes before he was old enough to drive. In fact, in 1987, when he was only 13 years old, he stabbed his first victim, Rebecca Spencer, to death. Two years later, he killed Joan Heaton and her two children. He was arrested a month before his 16th birthday and actually calmly confessed to the police when questioned. He was tried and convicted as a minor, which meant at the time that he would be released and his criminal records would be sealed when he was 21. Unfortunately, you won't have to worry about seeing him in public because in July of 2019, he got an additional 25 years as an adult for stabbing one of his cellmates. He also gained another 10 to 15 years for assaulting a corrections officer, violating probation, fighting with other inmates. He's currently in a Florida prison for violent inmates. Serial killer in your state, part 40, South Carolina. His name was Donald Henry Gaskins and they called him Pee Wee. Kind of a silly name for someone who took pleasure in torturing women by breaking their bones, biting them after kidnapping them off the highway. His entire life, he was arrested for raping and robbing people. In 1955, he escaped from prison and joined a traveling carnival. Now, Pee Wee himself claims that between 1955 and 1976, when he was caught, he killed over 200 people. He was charged with murdering eight women in 1976 after one of his friends told the police that he confessed to murder. They found eight bodies buried on his property in Prospect, South Carolina. While he was awaiting the death penalty on death row, he somehow managed to kill another inmate with an explosive. He was put to death in 1991, but he had time to write an autobiography where he called his sexual urges bothersomeness. Killer in your state, part 41, South Dakota. And at just 33 years old, he was executed by the state of South Dakota for killing a state division of criminal investigation special agent, Tom Matthews, who was trying to arrest him as he was a fugitive from Minnesota. He is the only person to have ever been executed by the electric chair in South Dakota and the last person to be executed by any lethal injection in South Dakota until July of 2007. The reason why he was in prison in the first place, he was because of a life sentence for shooting a sheriff in Butte County and also shooting a liquor store clerk in Minnesota. After getting away from that one, he fled to Wyoming where he got arrested on February 5th of 1946. Since he got the death penalty for killing the special agent, they didn't feel the need to put him in prison for the other three murders. His final words were a joke. This is the first time authorities helped me escape prison. It took four shocks for him to die. Killers in your state, part 42, Tennessee. In the 1990s, Paul Dennis Reed just wanted to be a country music singer, so he moved to Nashville. 
Of course, nobody in Nashville knew that he was out on parole from a 1983 conviction in Texas after robbing a Houston steakhouse. Like most struggling singers, he really didn't get his big break, and he ended up working at a fast food restaurant for a couple years just washing dishes. That is until he got fired in 1997, and he proceeded to, from February to April, begin robbing different fast food restaurants and shooting people inside of them. He attacked a Captain D's, a McDonald's, and a Baskin Robbins, and killed seven people. At the Captain D's, he forced a teenager and her manager to lay on the floor before he shot them in the back execution style. Then at the McDonald's, his gun failed, and he ended up stabbing a 17-year-old. At Baskin Robbins, it got particularly violent. He kidnapped two of the people who worked there and slashed their throats. He didn't live long enough to get lethal injection. He died of pneumonia in 2003. Killers in your state, part 43. It's Texas. And remember how I told you that California was the number one state in serial killers? Texas is number two with almost 700. Any 90s babies out there remember your parents telling you not to take candy from strangers? This guy is why. His name was Dean Coral, and he lured 28 kids and two teenage accomplices to his van with candy between 1970 and 1973. Nobody had any idea that he was the guy who was doing the crimes, and they just referred to them in the paper as the Houston murders because it happened just outside of Houston. The thing is, he almost got away with it until one of his accomplices, teenager Wayne Henley, turned on him and shot him, then called the police and admitted to what he did and what Coral did. After the media found out that he worked at a candy factory and how he lured children, they called him the Candy Man. Both David Brooks and Wayne Henley are in prison for helping Coral. They are serving life sentences. Killers in Your State, Part 44, Utah. And this fancy fellow here is John Doyle Lee. And I'm sure in this picture, he just looks like a nice, righteous, pious man, doesn't he? No, but he's not. He's actually a mass murderer. See, John Doyle Lee was an American pioneer and prominent member of the Church of Latter-day Saints who was convicted of his participation in the Mount Meadows Massacre. What is the Mount Meadows Massacre? I'm glad you asked. The Baker's French Party in 1857 were an immigrant group from Arkansas who camped at Mount Meadows. They were attacked by a group of Native Americans and Mormon militiamen dressed as Native Americans. On the third day of the siege, Lee, dressed just as his normal self, showed up and convinced the party to hand over all of their weapons and was waving a white flag. Then the rest of the militia showed up and killed 120 people, leaving only 17 children. He was executed in 1877 by firing squad. Killers in your state, part 45. It's Vermont. When Israel Keyes took his own life in Anchorage, Alaska in 2012, it was after admitting to being a serial killer, a rapist, a arsonist, a burglar, and a bank robber. While many people associate him with Alaska, he made a lot of stops across the country, killing 11 different people, specifically because he was trying to avoid capture. In 2011, Bill and Lorraine Courier were asleep in their Burlington, Vermont home when Keys broke into their house and blitzed attacked them. He woke them up and dragged them into his car, then took them to an abandoned house where he shot the husband, Bill, and then assaulted and strangled Lorraine. One awful fact that we do know about him is that he admired Ted Bundy and looked up to him. He was a heavy drinker just like Bundy and methodical and intelligent. However, Bundy had a preference for his victims and Keyes killed anybody. Killers in your estate, part 46, it's Virginia. Linwood James and Anthony Briley were a trio of siblings who were also serial killers slash spree killers, robbers, and rapists. Their murder and robbery spree took place in Richmond, Virginia in 1979, and they had an accomplice named Duncan Eric Meekins. When it was all said and done, they killed 11 people and two managed to escape. They were hard to pin down because they killed rich and poor people, white and black people, men and women, older and younger. Not to mention they used a different weapon in almost every single crime scene. Fire, a rifle, a cinder block, a baseball bat, knives, scissors, fork, pistols. While running away from one of the robberies, Meekins got caught by the police and turned state's evidence on the other three brothers. Anthony had limited involvement, so he only got a life sentence. Meekins turned them in for a life sentence, and Linwood and James were executed in 1984 and 1985. While both are eligible for parole, both Anthony and Duncan have been denied to the state. Killers in your state, part 47, Washington. This is Robert Lee Yates Jr., and he is known as the Spokane Killer. From 1975 to 1998, he murdered 11 women, or at least 11 women, in Spokane, Washington. He confessed 
to two 1975 murders in Walla Walla as well as a murder in 1988 in Skagit County. He was convicted of killing two women in Pierce County and sentenced to death in 2002. It would appear like many serial killers, he saw sex workers as easy targets and often he would kill them after procuring their services. One of the weirdest details of this case, though, is that one of his victims was buried outside of his house, literally his bedroom window, so he could look out at where he buried her. He was scheduled to be executed, but then in 2018, Washington outlawed executions, and now he's doing 408 years in prison. Killers in your state, number 48, it's West Virginia. This is Harry Powers, a.k.a. Cornelius Pearson, a.k.a. Joe Gildall, a.k.a. Herman Drenth. See, in 1927, the American Friendship Society created this matchmaking business, and you'd pay an annual fee, and you would get a list of eligible lovers in your area. Harry was just looking for love in Clarksburg, West Virginia, but every single woman he went on a date with disappeared afterward. In total, five women went missing, and when he got caught in 1932, he was convicted of killing two of those women and three of their children. When he was arrested, a crowd of people surrounded the county jail where he was being held and demanded that he be released to the public so that they could lynch him. The Clarksburg Fire Department had to use tear gas to disperse the crowd. But a year later, in 1932, he was executed by Hank at the Moundsville State Penitentiary. Killers in your state, part 49, it's Wisconsin. In 2005, Candy Williams met Joven Collier on a beach in Florida, and she thought she had met the man of her dreams. What she didn't know was that when he was 14 years old, he killed his mother, father, and brother. In May of 1983, sheriff's deputies from Mineral Point, Wisconsin, drove to the house uh, where Peter Zimmer lived, and they found a gruesome discovery. On the back porch, his father had been shot five times. He stabbed his mother to death and carried her to a shed in the back. His 10-year-old brother had been stabbed over 25 times and was covered in defensive wounds. Sheriffs on the scene said it was one of the worst crime scenes they had ever witnessed. The worst part is that he only did three years in a boy's home for these three murders. And at 19 years old, he was allowed to move to another state, change his name, and completely start a new life. But no worries, he's currently been arrested for felony stalking in Georgia. Killers in your states, part 50, we made it, it's Wyoming. This is Polly Bartlett, and she's known as Wyoming's first and worst serial killer. It's 1868, and there's a huge mining boom in the newly formed Wyoming Territory. Polly came with her family to South Pass City, and she opened up a boarding house specifically for gold miners. Now, here's where the history gets fazy, and we're not sure if it's just legend, but either way, uh, legend says that she killed 22 of her boarders with arsenic and disposed of their bodies in a local corral. The Pickerton detectives ended up getting called in on this case. Her family skipped town, and then there was a reward put out to find them. While on the run, Polly's father gets killed during a shootout. Polly gets nabbed by the police and taken to Atlantic City, Wyoming. Somewhile while she's there awaiting trial, one of her victim's friends finds her and shoots her while she's in prison. And that's what we know about Polly Bartlett.